What's going on, everyone? Let's talk today about the air war in Ukraine, specifically tied to the Russian Air Force and their performance. That's an area I feel like hasn't gotten a lot of attention since the war kicked off. And there's a lot of questions, or at least I have a lot of questions. So this article here really stood out to me. It's titled, The Russian Air War and Ukrainian Requirements for Air Defense by Justin Bronk, Nick Reynolds, and Jack Watling from RUSI, which stands for the Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies. I'll put a link to the full article in the description below. It's like 40 or 50 pages, so not too awful long, but there is a lot to pull out of that. Now, they're going to walk through a couple different phases that we'll hit on in this video. It's going to start with kind of the Russian fixed-wing operations in Ukraine. That'll shift to rotary wing operations or helicopters. Then there's a section about drones and missiles. And finally, what Ukraine needs to continue fighting this war. So diving on in, they say the VKS, which stands for Russian Aerospace Forces or Russian Air Force, had deployed a fast jet force of around 350 modern combat aircraft for operations in Ukraine. So the lack of a publicly visible air campaign came as a major surprise to most analysts. I agree. Right in that camp, we expected Russia to achieve air superiority early on and to see their aircraft overhead daily in Ukraine. That really hasn't been the case, and they're going to talk about that. They continued the tentative conclusions reached by this author, so the group writing this article, in March about the lack of VKS capacity to mount complex large-scale operations still hold today. But early analysis was wrong about the lack of significant Russian air activity in the early days of the war. They say that mobile air defense assets, such as short-range SA-15 and medium-range SA-17, had been sent into Ukraine with no functional communications plan. They were also advancing out of sequence and often separated from the formations that they were supposed to protect. And they were operating under very restrictive rules of engagement, which instructed them to assume anything flying was Russian. The inability of radar-guided SAM surface-to-air missiles on either side to perform as anticipated during the first week and a half meant that fixed-wing aircraft on both sides had remarkable freedom to penetrate significant distances across the rapidly changing front lines. This fits with a lot of what we've heard, kind of the surprise of the invasion uh, within a lot of the Russian units, and they weren't necessarily equipped and organized in a way to kick off an invasion. So some of these these air defense assets, think of them like providing a bubble to the troops as they move forward to protect them from anything, airborne drones, helicopters, or fixed-wing aircraft. When those push out forward, they didn't know who was who. There wasn't enough communication there, and there was probably a belief that the Russian Air Force would have control of the skies. So to be safe, they told all their people, don't shoot, assume that it's Russian. And that allowed a lot of air-to-air combat in the first few days, even weeks of the war. If you remember, there were a lot of stories about dogfights early in the war, and that really stopped pretty quick. And anyways... One of the reasons they point to that is this kind of hold on not using the air defenses. They continued, at the start of the invasion, Russian Su-34 frontal bombers and Su-30s and Su-35s flew around 140 sorties per day missions, conducting fighter sweeps and strike sorties up to 300 kilometers inside Ukrainian territories at altitudes between 12,000 and 30,000 feet. Nothing crazy there, pretty standard altitudes. That's quite a few sorties, but also pretty substantial combat in those first few weeks. During the first three days, the primary targets of these VKS VKS strikes were Ukrainian air defenses. Over 100 long-range radar installations, bases, munition storage sites, and positions occupied by mobile, long, and medium-range SAM systems were attacked with Russian fixed-wing sorties, concentrating their activities along the routes intended to be used by airborne and helicopter assault forces. Nothing crazy there. The, the Russians had an idea as to where a lot of these locations were um, set, a lot of where the, where the surface-to-air missiles, especially the longer-range things, were located, the radar sites. So these pilots in the first few days flying these sorties had a target list. They knew where they were headed without having to gather new intel of assets moving around the battlefield, which will end up being a problem later in the fight, and that's something we'll get to. They continue, notably, all the medium and high-level strikes were conducted against pre-designated targets that had been extensively mapped by reconnaissance bombers. So again, Russia knew where a lot of these locations were prior to the invasion. They were just completing their strikes in those first few days. SU-34s carried out the bulk of the strikes with multiple unguided bombs and during the first week typically operated at medium altitudes of around 12,000 feet. That's not crazy. Nothing, Nothing there is out of the ordinary. At the point of the first few days of the war, everything is kind of going as planned. 
I think I would say. They continued by saying most of these medium-level daylight strikes were carried out by single aircraft with fewer than 25% of strikes conducted by pairs or larger formations, and none were observed that involved more than six aircraft in a strike package. That's starting to get a little unique. Um, one aircraft at a time, not even pairs, uh, and it gets into BDA saying this contributed to inconsistent battle damage as well as inefficient battle damage assessments, BDA, meaning the follow, follow-on strikes were seldom carried out. It's very difficult for a pilot carrying out the strike to conduct their own battle damage assessment, especially in a contested environment like it was Ukraine. So often these pilots would have to report back what they think they hit, um, and it's not, it wouldn't be entirely accurate. Whether they were trying to be deceitful or not, they just don't have the ability to effectively identify what was destroyed on the ground and what was missed. They say, nevertheless, VKS fixed-wing airstrikes were effective in the south, where in conjunction with crews and ballistic missiles, attacks badly degraded the limited Ukrainian Air Force and naval air defense capacity deployed in the Kherson and Zaporozhye regions. Russian Su-35 and Russian Su-30 fighters flew numerous high-altitude combat air patrols at around 30,000 feet in support of the medium-altitude Russian strike aircraft operating widely during the first three days. They scored multiple air-to-air kills against Ukrainian MiG-29 and Su-27 fighters. As well, Ukrainian pilots confirmed that Russia's Su-30 and Su-35 completely outclassed Ukrainian Air Force fighter aircraft on a technical level. I don't think that this is a surprise to anyone. Um, If we go back to the start of the war, it was pretty commonplace to hear that the Ukrainian Air Force was technologically inferior to the Russian Air Force. A lot of their equipment came from Russia. They were uh, exported versions of some of the newer Russian models or some of the older Soviet models. So I am not the person to talk to when we get into the specifics of why one aircraft is better than the other and the different targeting pods and engines and all of that. Uh, But at a high level, I think it's safe to say that then and, and probably still today, Russia maintains the technological advantage when it comes to air power, which has been one of the confusing factors. Where the heck are they, right? This deeply unequal radar and missile performance compared with Russian fighters, as well as being tactically outnumbered by up to 15 to 2 in some cases, forced Ukrainian pilots to fly extremely low to exploit ground clutter and terrain, masking to get close enough to fire before being engaged. It's a different type of fight. Like very early on, it's a totally different type of fight. Ukraine was outnumbered. Um, and likely outmatched in a lot of ways, so they took up different tactics. In early March, however, Russian surface-to-air missile defenses rapidly became much better coordinated, and the threat from long-range S-400 systems based in Belarus and Crimea forced Ukrainian aircraft to fly at extremely low altitude, below 100 feet. That's crazy low for most of their sorties in the northern and southern axes. The range on those S-400s is substantial. It's something we're going to get into here in a minute. Um, so the Ukrainian fighters have to move further and further back from the front lines as they're being detected at longer ranges. On the other side of the coin, the most effective Ukrainian surface air missiles against Russian fixed-wing aircraft have consistently been the SA-11 systems, alongside the longer-ranged S-300s that have escaped destruction during the initial wave of strikes. The SA-11s quickly made Russian medium and high-altitude operations prohibitively dangerous on the Kyiv and Kharkiv axes. They continue, at the same time, the VKS VKS received new targeting priorities as it was swiftly becoming clear to the Russian leadership that the original military plan to rapidly seize Kyiv and other key cities and overthrow the Ukrainian government had failed. Therefore, the main VKS air effort was switched from attacks on Ukrainian air defense capabilities to attempts to support the ground forces directly. That's a major change because we're talking about targets and locations that are generally known before the war. We've talked about this in previous videos, but... The intelligence on the ground, whether or not it panned out perfectly, Russia had a lot of intelligence of Ukrainian military facilities across the country prior to the war. It's just been a big focus of theirs uh, for a long, long time. So as soon as that target list is depleted or those targets move, as some of these mobile surface air missile systems could do, it changes the game entirely. And now they're trying to support troops in contact, troops on the ground, Russian offensives or stopping Ukrainian counteroffensives. It's a totally different use of air power and a big shift here um, when this happened. They say the failure of Russia's initial strike campaign to destroy the bulk of Ukrainians' medium-range S-11 and SA-8 SAMs meant that as the VKS, VKS was retasked to attack Ukrainian army positions in aid of ground offensives, 
its pilots were forced to abandon flying at medium or high altitudes when penetrating Ukrainian airspace. This is one of those weird things when it comes to surface air missiles. Um, sometimes the lower you get to the ground, like closer to the missile, the harder it is for the missile to effectively track on, uh, to lock on and, and track the aircraft. So because all of these SA-11s and SA-8s were still active, the Russian Air Force had to drop down to very low altitudes, and that's going to play out in a significant manner here. At a very low level, radar-guided SAM systems have a comparatively short effective range due to clutter and the curvature of the Earth blocking their radar field of view to the target. Therefore, the final days of February and the first week of March saw the VKS conduct around 140 sorties per day using Su-25, Su-30, and Su-34 aircraft to conduct strikes at 500 feet or below using unguided bombs and rockets on Ukrainian positions. That's, you know, it's not the 100 feet they're saying Ukraine flew at for a little while, but 500 feet is super low, uh, especially the speeds these aircraft are moving. While flying low did reduce the losses from radar-guided SAMs, I think you know where this is headed, it also brought Russian, j Russian jets into the range of the thousands of manned portable air defense systems, man pads, that have been widely used, widely issued to Ukrainian troops. The results were predictable with at least eight Su-25, Su-30, and Su-34 jets being shot down by man pads in one week. So pick your poison, right? The more accurate, more deadly, longer range SA-11s target the aircraft that are up high so they come down low, and now you got to deal with more man pads that are less effective, have a shorter range, but there's magnitudes more of them floating around the battlefield. That's going to be an interesting piece in a minute here when we start talking about helicopters. Continuing on the low-level unguided bomb strikes by Russian forces, they say these strikes were also significantly less accurate than the medium-level bombing that had been conducted in the first few days and in Syria, since they were also conducted with unguided bombs and rockets. At very low levels, pilots have only seconds to visually acquire, identify, and then maneuver their aircraft to accurately drop weapons on targets. In this case, the targets were Ukrainian forces, which were frequently dug in and operating many of the same vehicles and weapons as Russian forces. A lack of up-to-date maps also compounded low-level navigation and target recognition difficulties for, Ukraine, for Russian pilots. Consequently, penetrating daylight low-level strikes achieved little serious damage against Ukrainian forces, and the concept of operations was rapidly judged to be unsustainable by experienced pilots, who quickly began to refuse to fly missions beyond Ukrainian lines. It makes sense, right? They've, they're, they're losing access to different levels of altitude to fly their aircraft. Now they're coming in low, trying to strike targets close. And I mean, look at this imagery here. How can you tell which is the Russian position, which is the Ukrainian position? What if they change spots, change positions in the matter of a couple of days? And if those maps aren't updated, if the graphics aren't updated, you risk bombing your own troops. And in the middle of all that, they're, they're battling the thousands of man pads flooded across Ukraine. So interesting, this is the first time I've heard that, that some of the more experienced Russian pilots start to push back and say, it's not worth it, what we're doing right now these tactics at least. They continue to say throughout March, Su-35 and Su-30 fighters continue to conduct combat air patrols between 30 and 50,000 feet, but generally without entering Ukrainian controlled airspace. Instead, they acted as a deterrent to Ukrainian attack sorties, but were also tasked to conduct suppression of enemy air defense operations. To this end, their combat air patrols were used as bait to try to make the Ukrainian SAM systems turn on their radars to fire at them. If SA-11s or other SAMs did try to engage them, the flankers uh, would use anti-radiation missiles at long ranges to home in on the radar missions and then turn away. Meanwhile, SU-25 singles or pairs flown by experienced crews would fly in at low altitude to try to find and kill the SAM with rockets while it was being suppressed. So again, we've got a totally different type of, of uh, aerial warfare playing out here where the Russian... Anti-radiation missiles have a substantial range, so there's standoff to be had there. So they're backing off at a distance that is still within range, kind of trying to dabble in range of some of these Ukrainian air defense systems. And then as soon as they're in range and Russia or Ukraine turns on the radar system to try to shoot these down, it, it lights up for some of these Russian fighters in the area trying to take them out. So, yeah, cat and mouse is the best way to describe it at that point. Russian troops also began to effectively coordinate operations with hunting complexes of Orlin-10 UAVs to force Ukrainian SAM systems to unmask and then suppress them for long enough using electronic warfare to designate individual SAMs for accurate artillery and missile strikes. This rapidly forced medium-range Ukrainian Air Force SA-11s and short-range Ukrainian Army SA-8 SAM systems to operate further back from the front lines 
to reduce loss rates and allow Russian aircraft a significant of, and allowed Russian aircraft a significant degree of freedom to operate at medium and high altitude in the vicinity of the front lines. That's a little confusing there, but essentially they're sending these cheap, and they have a lot of them. Around 2,000 of these Orlin 10 drones were made that you see here on the screen. They'd send these out. It's, it's primarily a reconnaissance drone. There's kind of ways to make it an attack drone, but this is primarily a recon asset. So they would send these out into Ukrainian airspace, and Ukraine has to make the decision. Are we going to let that thing map our locations for potential artillery strikes, or do we shoot it down? Now, if it's shot down with a man pad, great. Or a surface air cannon, anti-aircraft anti cannon, fine. But if it's shot down with a surface air missile system like the SA-11 or the SA-8, that all of a sudden, again, primes some of these Russian aircraft that are in the general vicinity to fly in and either take those out or relay those coordinates to uh, artillery and missile units to be able to take them out. It's, it's an interesting dynamic in this war that I feel like we haven't heard a lot about. Shifting to helicopters. Alongside the Su-35 frontal bomber fleet, the dominant ground attack platform in the Russian air campaign has been the Ka-52 Alligator attack helicopter. Alongside the Mi-28 Havoc and Mi-24 and 35 Hind gunships, the Ka-52 fleet conducted offensive hunter-killer sorties at very low altitude against Ukrainian forces during the early months of the war. These sorties were generally flown in pairs and used a combination of unguided rockets and cannon fire against troop concentration, soft skin vehicles, and anti-tank guided missiles against armored vehicles and other hardened targets. Now, this is the helicopter that has taken uh, proportionally the most losses in Ukraine. Russian helicopter defensive aids combining missile uh, approach warning scenario sensors and countermeasures dispensing programs have functioned reasonably well throughout the conflict. Things like flares kicking out to uh, distract man pads, if you will. Succeeding in decoying many incoming missiles, however, the sheer number of man pads fired at them during penetrating sorties ensured that many hits were still scored. At, at some point, the helicopter is going to run out of these countermeasures, uh, and it happens sometimes during one flight. It's not an unlimited number of flares they have available, right? So if they're flying over a Ukrainian position, and in the span of 30 minutes, 15 man pads are fired at them, at some point, they're going to run out of, of countermeasures, and the aircraft is going to be hit. They continue, the British Star Streak and American Javelin anti-tank missiles used in direct attack mode have been particularly effective against all Russian helicopters as they are immune to being decoyed by flares or chaff countermeasures. However, these weapons require a significantly greater level of operator training and are more expensive and scarcer than normal man pads. The Javelin has also largely been saved for attacks on Russian tanks. It was interesting. I haven't heard a lot about Star Streak and uh, Javelins being used against helicopters, but it makes sense. So talking about the losses of the K-52, they say after heavy initial losses, Russian helicopters are almost solely engaged in attacks with unguided rockets from behind Russian front lines during the Russian offensive in Donbass between April and July, and in defensive operations against Ukrainian counteroffensives in Kherson and Kharkiv since September. During these indirect rocket attacks, Russian helicopters typically approach their target while flying below 200 feet then pitch up between 15 and 30 degrees and fire unguided rockets in a lofted trajectory against known concentrations of Ukrainian forces in a general grid square. As expected, immediately after firing all their rockets in a salvo, they turn away while dropping countermeasures without crossing their own lines. If you've seen videos of Russian helicopters firing rockets, that's it, right? They come in low, they pitch up, they fire their rockets, the flares kick, and they go. So they're right on that line of being in range of Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian surface air systems. But, as you might expect here, the accuracy that can be obtained using these tactics is generally poor, sufficient only to force Ukrainian forces in the open to take cover or to fix dug-in units in place until the impacts subside. Just not a lot happening. When you're lobbing rockets from kilometers away to a general grid square, you're just not expecting uh, too much in terms of results. It's suppressing fire in a sense. They continue, what stands out is that the Ka-52 fleet has taken a disproportionate number of losses compared to the other gunship types operated by Russia. They say there are several reasons that likely have contributed to this. First, the Ka-52 has seen more intensive use than the other fleets, both by day and especially at night. Second, the Ka-52 has notable deficiencies in armor protection compared with other Russian attack helicopters, especially the engine compartments, which have no armor plating at all, leaving them potentially vulnerable to damage from even small arms fire. Third, the Ka-52 uses a different anti-tank guided missile from the Mi-28 and Mi-24 and 35. The 9K-121 Vickr uses a laser beam riding guidance system 
with the seeker on the missile mounted at the rear facing backwards rather than in the nose like a traditional laser seeker. In other words, the seeker on the Vicar looks back at the helicopter to see the laser guidance beam rather than looking for a laser spot reflected off the target. This makes it almost impossible to jam in flight. It's also cheaper, but it also means the KA-52 cannot drift more than a few degrees per second to the left, right, up, or down while guiding the missile in flight. The result has been the Ukrainian troops have been able to shoot down KA-52s using wire-guided anti-tank missiles on several occasions when the helicopters are hovering almost stationary, attempting to identify and guide their Vickr missiles to targets near the front lines. Shifting to, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about drones, specifically the Shahed 15136 and missiles. They say the Russian invasion began with a heavy cruise and ballistic missile barrage, the opening salvo in a sustained long-range precision strike campaign, which averaged around 24 missiles per day for the first three months of the war. From 24 February to the end of May, more than 2,000 cruise missiles were fired into Ukraine, usually in salvos of 4 to 12 at once. Additionally, around 240 ballistic missiles were also fired from Iskander ground-based launchers at around 160 different targets. They say Russian land attack cruise missiles and ballistic missiles have performed well throughout the conflict, and I think this will be surprising to a lot of folks, myself included, with most impacting between 3 and 10 meters of their intended aiming points, except when degraded by Ukrainian electronic warfare assets. Intercepting Russian ballistic missiles has proven very difficult throughout the conflict due to a lack of suitable interceptor missiles and the short range of potential coverage for each system against such threats. The Iskander is especially problematic for Ukrainian air defenses due to its quasi-ballistic maneuvering capabilities and the fact that it launches six penetration aids to generate additional radar returns and electronic warfare effects during its terminal phase. That's going to be a theme here for the rest of this article, the challenges of air defense in Ukraine with missiles, aircraft, primarily with missiles and drones. After the initial salvos failed to destroy Ukrainian air defense capability on 24 February, the Russian target detection, tracking, and fire mission assignment process was not fast enough to stay ahead of Ukrainian disperse, dispersal and shoot-and-scoot tactics. So it makes sense. Now these Ukrainian artillery and air defense assets are not just staying in fixed locations like an S-300 can move around the battlefield. And once Russia lost them in the first few days of the war, they've been very hard to keep up with in the targeting cycle. Having failed to achieve a quick military victory in the first few days, Russian long-range strike assets were retasked in early March from Ukrainian air defense cities to infrastructure and government targets. Not crazy different from what we saw on the fixed-wing uh, side. Fixed-wing were tasked to support offensive operations on the ground, moving units in offensive and defensive operations. The missiles shifted over to more infrastructure and government targets. Russia also relies heavily, relies heavily on its long-range precision strike arsenal for conventional and tactical nuclear deterrent capability against NATO under the doctrine of non-contact warfare. With the Russian army increasingly bogged down and overstretched in Ukraine, Russia cannot afford to fire its entire stockpile. Therefore, Russia's military leadership began to plan for a new set of targeting criteria that could deliver a greater strategic effect with a limited number of total missiles available. They say the next major Russian bombardment was instigated in June. Several weeks of daily strikes against Ukrainian uh, fuel storage facilities, refineries, and key railway infrastructure. This potentially could have had a very serious effect on the Ukrainian population and the war effort over time if it had been conducted on a large scale from the outset. However, two major factors conspired to reduce its impact to a manageable level. First, Ukrainian air defenses had, by this stage, been reorganized and redeployed to provide much more effective coverage against cruise missiles around key cities and facilities. In March and April, interception rates had been around 20 to 30 percent. By mid-June, they were between 50 and 60 percent. Second, Russia was already running uncomfortably low on missile stocks given its requirements to maintain a contingency stockpile to deter NATO and the heavy expenditure from February to June. As a result of these shortages, Firing rates of Russia's standard long-range land attack missiles were lower from June to September than the 24-day average in the first months of the war, than the 24-per-day average in the first months of the war. So Russia's firing fewer missiles, and more of those missiles are being intercepted. So it doesn't take rocket science to figure out it's not having maybe the desired effect. Russia also began to regularly use its S-300s in the land attack role. This was an interesting development, especially in the south near Kherson. In the land attack role, it has a ballistic trajectory with a maximum range of 82 kilometers. Its high supersonic speed makes it impossible to intercept with current Ukrainian air defense systems 
and it delivers a large 130 kilogram high explosive fragmentation warhead. However, it is a very inaccurate weapon, being purely ballistic with no terminal housing capa homing capabilities against ground targets. So Russian forces generally use them as indiscriminate bombardment weapons against cities, especially Mikolaev. Moving into some of the Iranian drones here, the new Russian strategy opened with a barrage of cruise missiles and ballistic missiles against targets in multiple Ukrainian cities, including central Kyiv, on 10 October. This time, cruise missiles were launched alongside tens of Shahed 136 loitering munitions. More than half the total incoming weapons were shot down by Ukrainian air defenses, but those that got through still inflicted serious damage and multiple civilian casualties. I've seen that rate debated a lot, saying how did Ukraine shoot down so many and there was still so much damage out of the city. That's what these are designed to do, these, these relatively inexpensive loitering munitions, specifically these ones coming from Iran, they're, they're designed to overwhelm air defenses. That's a part of, that's a part of how they work. Um, I don't want to say that they're supposed to get shot down, but some of them are supposed to eat up some surface air missiles, if you will, clearing the way for the rest. Uh, and it appears that's how Russia is using these as of late. They continue, most of the Shahed 136 that are launched are being shot down by Ukrainian fighters, SAMs, manpad teams, and anti-aircraft gunfire. However, they are being used in large enough numbers already, with more than 400 fired since mid-September, that they are draining Ukraine's air defense missile stocks in an alarming way. And still, each day, some get through to their targets. This draining of Ukraine's uh, missile defense and air defense assets is something we're going to focus on here for the last little bit of the article. After the success of the Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kharkiv, its subsequent recapture of Lehman and continued pressure on Luhansk and Kherson, Russia is faced with the prospect of military defeat on the ground in 2023. Partial Russian mobilization will take several months to produce even barely competent new troops to augment battered regular units, let alone entire new formations. In response to the lack of viable options on the ground, Russia's leaders have turned to a renewed, long-range bombardment against civilian and critical utilities. The plan is to cause enough civilian suffering that the Zelensky government is either forced to negotiate ceasefire terms or face major civil unrest that delays preparations for a renewed counteroffensive push to liberate the remaining occupied territories of Ukraine in spring 2023. Getting back to the drone and how that thing is being shot down, how it can be shot down, the weapon's simple, not especially difficult to intercept, but most of the current means of doing so are too expensive or draw on unacceptable numbers of weapons required for other defense tasks to provide an adequate medium-term solution. In the short term, therefore, Ukraine urgently requires deliveries of large number of additional man pads for mobile and static air defense teams, many modern self-propelled anti-aircraft guns, such as the Gepard, as possible. It also requires additional supplies of night vision goggles to enable man pad teams to operate effectively at night. A lot of these Shahed strikes have been in low light hours, so those night vision goggles tied in with the man pads could make a big difference. They continue in the medium term, Ukraine needs to produce or needs a way to produce or at least procure and operate efficient defense systems against the Shahed and other UAVs at scale. Countries that have significant experience defending against multiple relatively slow loitering munitions and UAVs, such as South Korea, Saudi Arabia, and Israel, would make sense in terms of potential sources of ideas. Not necessarily. Some of those are probably unlikely to actually send equipment. Ukraine also needs a way to resupply its Soviet-made and domestically upgraded S-300, SA-11 SAM systems in both the anti-missile and battlefield anti-aircraft counter UAV role. Eight months of high-intensity combat have consumed unprecedented and unforeseen quantities of interceptor missiles, and Western allies have very few ways to supply more directly or indirectly. That's uh, a challenge. A challenge since day one of the Ukrainian conflict is a lot of the weapon systems they're using are made, or most of them are made in Russia and have been for a long time. So how do we resupply components and parts of some of these historic Russian systems? Because we're not going to get them, they're not going to get them from Russia, right? Uh, in the United States, likely, I mean, I don't know what the effort would take for the U.S. to start creating interceptor missiles for the S-300, but uh, it's not fast. It would take quite a while to do that, which is why you see some of the conversion to more NATO stock over the last couple months. Finally, the Ukrainian Air Force also urgently needs more weapon systems that can enhance standoff lethality of its existing attack jet, attack jet fleet in a similar manner as the AGM-88 Harm. As it was integrated to allow CAD strikes, uh, suppression of enemy air defensive strikes against Russian SAMs. In the medium term, Ukraine needs new fighter aircraft, 
able to meet Russian fighters on more equal terms as soon as possible, especially providing sufficient ammunition to provide to maintain frontline SAM coverage proves difficult. So that's it. Uh, I thought pretty interesting article, pretty interesting coverage of the Russian air war in Ukraine. I didn't realize the degree of cat and mouse that was going back and forth with each one of these systems introduced to the fight. Something changes and the tactics change. Um, does seem like Russia is still relatively active in the air, just having to be pushed further and further back from the front lines. But it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I think just yesterday it was announced that Russia is leaving her son. So it's a war and it's a battlefield. It's always changing. Interested in your thoughts? Uh, did this line up with kind of what you thought about the air war in Ukraine? Totally new, somewhere in between. Let me know, but that'll do it for now. We'll see you all next time.